very much, Christoph, for that very kind introduction. Um, and also to the Rachel Carson Centre for indeed bringing me here out of my isolation in Perth, which I, I have this very ambivalent relationship with. I, I do love Perth. I love being able to sit in Perth and have topics come to me because I'm the one who does environmental history in the West largely. But it is good to get out and, and see what happens in the wider world and talk with people like yourselves. Uh, and I'd like to thank each of you for coming along here today. Uh, as Christoph mentioned, this is a work in prospect, so this is an idea. This is an idea that is at present barely formulated, and I realise that I'm asking uh, my indulgence of you to, to come here and comment on this, this research, which is largely yet to be done. Uh, but hopefully we can all take something away from this talk today, um, not just myself. So in this talk, I want to share with you my ideas for a new environmental history of Australia. And this project takes as its starting point the idea that nature and culture are inseparable, an understanding that calls for new histories that explore not only the character of nature-culture engagements, but also how and why the so-called natural and cultural became separated and with what consequences. So today I want to start by briefly outlining the project as a whole, including some of its theoretical underpinnings, and situating it in relation to the existing Australian environmental historiography. Then I'll tell you a story. And I want to do this firstly because if I spent the whole time talking about historiography and what I plan to do, we'll all get bored. But this story includes lovely pictures of rare flowers and scenic views, as well as fire, shooting and vandalism. Also, it's one of the stories that I plan to include in the history, so it provides an example, albeit an abbreviated example, for the purposes of today's presentation uh, of my intended approach. So, as I've said, as a work in prospect, I'm really keen to gather feedback on what you think of my ideas and my, my uh, proposed approach, and of course I'm happy to answer any questions you might have uh, when I finish. Or indeed, halfway through, if you've got a burning question you really want to ask as I'm going, then please do so. So I had this idea to write a new environmental history of Australia largely because most of them are now getting on. They were largely written in the 1990s and none have been written in a way that's informed by the recent material turn. Why do we need environmental histories of Australia at all, one might ask. After all, it's so far away and so few people live there. But its history makes it an interesting site in which to trace the manifold effects of the sudden arrival of new cultures, technologies and organisms into fairly stable social ecological systems. Also, at least some of the 23 million odd Australians are interested in the part of the world they live in and how it relates to the whole. And maybe also people beyond that, hopefully. So, so far, there's four book-length environmental histories of Australia that have been published. First of all, Geoffrey Bolton's Spoils and Spoilers, which was first written in 1981 and revised in 1992. And it's a, it's a fine work with a chronological thematic structure covering most of the continent from Aboriginal times with a nod to deep time. Geoffrey's approach is expansive and critical, showing how the pursuit of development in the Australian context unleashed destructive forces across the continent, although he also traces efforts to conserve particular places and species. Then we have William Lyons, Taming the Great South Land, a history of the conquest of nature in Australia. And I think here the subtitle really says it all. This is a, a, a history that's not without its merits, but it's a, a, quite a partisan history written by a deep ecologist. A more thematic approach is taken by Neil Barr and John Carey in Greening a Brown Land, The Australian Search for Sustainable Land Use, which is an upbeat history of technological and scientific success in the face of adversity, written by two experts in natural resource management. More recently, we have Libby Robin's How a Continent Created a Nation, written in 2006, which isn't really a general environmental history, but focuses on the role of science and scientists in producing understandings of Australian nature and the place of those understandings in visions of and for the nation. There's also a few works in which Australia features prominently within broader regional or Australian contexts, and you might be familiar with some of these. Firstly, there's Tim Flannery's The Future Eaters, an ecological history of the Australasian lands and people. So being Australasian, it also takes in New Zealand, Papua New Guinea, uh, and so on. Uh, Flannery is a mammologist rather than a historian. He's also somewhat of a public intellectual in Australia. Uh, his book contains a significant focus on the long durée. Indeed, we're 12 chapters into the book before humans even arrive on the scene. 
Then there's Tom Dunlap's Nature in the English Diaspora, in which Australia features along Canada, alongside Canada, New Zealand and the United States. And then Don Garden's Australia, New Zealand and the Pacific, an environmental history, which presents a solid, if quite conventional, overview with primary source documents written primarily for students. So, of course, that's a very broad brushstroke sketch of the, the general continental scale environmental historiography of Australia. And there's many more fine works in Australian environmental history that focus on particular themes, periods, places and so on. But with so few histories taking a, a kind of continental approach and those that exist having been written mainly in the 1990s, I think the time is ripe for a new Australian environmental history that reflects current theories and understandings, and dare I say it, an environmental history of Australia for the Anthropocene, which is where we get to my approach. So I believe that the heart of our present predicament in which essential life systems are under threat lies the modern conceit that humanity and nature are separate realms with different roles and qualities. And this gives rise to the constant need to kind of separate and purify the social and the natural, which then becomes a kind of fetish that prevents us from comprehending how the human and non-human come together to produce outcomes that are just or unjust for the network as a whole, that sustain or foreclose on human and non-human flourishing. Now Bruno Latour proposes that this conceptual divine has been elaborated incrementally over time from around the 17th century through the creation and adoption of what he calls the modern constitution. Under this constitution, the non-human world appears to modern humanity in two guises. Firstly, as a set of ironclad laws to be obeyed, identified by the scientific method and associated apparatus, such as Robert Boyle's air pump. Alternately, it appears as a mute object to be manipulated and controlled by conscious speaking citizens, those who come together as agents, for example, in Thomas Hobbes' social contract. This means of mentally organising the world obs obscures and ignores the reality that there is no such division, only a diverse and dynamic set of entities or systems in which humanity and non-humanity are inextricably entangled. Now this theoretical perspective of course is not new, having been adopted by a range of geographers and science and technology studies uh, scholars in particular. However, as far as I know, it's not been taken up as a basis for in historical inquiry on a <coughs> continental scale. Now Australia is an excellent place, I think, in which to trace the fate of the modern constitution and its ontological commitment to the separation of society and nature. Its sudden arrival with British colonisers in 1788 raises several questions, such as, to what extent did its contrast with the organic worldview of the local Aboriginal peoples highlight and strengthen the newcomers' commitment to it? What understandings of human and non-human, society and nature, did it produce in this unfamiliar context and with what consequences? And here, understandings of the human include notions of race, gender and so on. I also propose that physical proximity has played a key role in the way this nature-society divide has been constructed. The urban elites and middle class in particular increasingly distanced, uh, they increasingly used technology and regulatory means in an effort to distance themselves from particular kinds of nature, whilst being increasingly involved in, it, in its transformation in ever-widening circles. As we've been increasingly confronted by the results of our dealings with the non-human and the impossibility of preserving nature in a pure form, so we've redoubled our efforts to sequester it in space and freeze it in time. However, the so-called social and natural has remained firmly entangled, and in the stories that will comprise my history, I intend to focus on both non-humans humans as agents within networks of society-nature entanglement, as well as human understandings of the society-nature divide, so I have this kind of dual purpose. The key questions driving this project are therefore, how has the modern constitution been reproduced in Australian contexts and with what effects? How have the human and non-human actually been entangled in Australian places? What power differences and inequalities did these networks produce and how and why have they changed over time? Importantly, I don't intend to simply describe socio-ecological assemblages, but will seek to explain why they form in the way they do and with what material and political consequences. 
So my focus is on the Australian continent, including Tasmania, but not the nation. In fact, I, I imagine it as a kind of anti-national history in a way, because the nation will likely figure so marginally in it. And Christoph and I had an interesting talk a little earlier in the week about the role of the nation in national histories. And already my thinking is evolving quite fast on whether this is or isn't a national history. I thought it was, but now I'm convinced that it's not. It's an Australian kind of continental scale environmental history. So though the work is going to be theoretically informed, I also hope to make it free of jargon that's likely to alienate generalist readers. Um, at this point, I anticipate that the book will be organised by types of natural social hybrid entities, starting with oceans, moving on to freshwater, forests, farms, deserts, mines, bodies, both human and animal, including microorganisms, cities, reserves or national parks, and climates. And the intention in each chapter will be to open up conversations around each of these entities by telling stories from select times and places and suggesting patterns of change and continuity rather than attempting any kind of comprehensive survey. The stories will include a focus on affect and action, what was felt and done, rather than only what was thought, said and written. I also hope to introduce new stories rather than just telling old stories in a new way. And partly uh, this will uh, sort of draw on my existing um, knowledge of Western Australian environmental history. At present, Australian environmental history is very much dominated by stories arising from the eastern seaboard, and they feel quite happy, I think, to ignore what goes on in the West. But in, re in rewriting a continental scale environmental history, I hope to focus on not only the, the sort of semi neglected West, but also the, the tropical North, which is sometimes seen as a separate place altogether. So, for example, the chapter on mining will be centred not around the gold rushes of the 19th century, which loom so large in Australian historiography of all shades, but the remarkable story of the Hammersley Ranges in the north of Western Australia, hills comprised of iron ore that are one of the oldest weathered surfaces on the earth and inhabited by one of the oldest continuous cultures on earth. This was the site of a mining boom starting in the 1960s in which the state became known as the land of movable mountains as the state government and transnational capital joined forces to export massive quantities of iron ore to a post-war re-industrialising Japan. So the conclusion will look at what this historical perspective offers for a new Australian environmental politics and a new way of belonging in a more than human continent. So that's really the, the big idea. But now I want to move on to the story, which involves the Stirling Range National Park. Um, as I've said, it's somewhat truncated for the purpose of today's talk. But if you have any questions relating to specific points, I'd be more than happy to elaborate uh, when, we, when, I, when I finish my presentation. So the Stirling Range National Park is, as you see here, it's this big um, square that's since been kind of carved out by agricultural development around it. So there it is in the context of Western Australia as a whole. And here we are, isolated little Perth. Um, it includes Bluff Knoll, which at 1,095 metres is the only place in Western Australia that regularly receives snow, which would explain why I was so excited when a few weeks after we got here we woke up and there was snow in the backyard. <laughs> Never been in a place like that before. Marvellous. Love it. Um, it's a biodiversity hotspot um, and an important site of domestic tourism. Now the story of this national park has multiple origins. One is the Paleoproterozoic era when the earth was still young and it was at that time that the sediments were deposited that would later be metamorphosed and folded to produce the rocks that would form the park's dramatic peaks as the surrounding landscape was eroded over millennia. After splitting from Antarctica some 60 million years ago, the area that's now the southwest of the continent of, Western, of Australia was isolated by the remainder, first by a massive inland sea, then by desert. The rapid climatic swings of the Quatern Quaternary period, combined with the region's old weathered soils, also promoted speciation over small areas, which produced a flora with high levels of diversity and endemism. In the early 20th century, the fate of these areas' ecosystems would hang to a very considerable extent on the presence of these geological features and the unique and diverse plants. Their emotional, physiological and intellectual impact on particular people and how they slotted into globally circulating discourses on conservation and recreation. 
Well before that time, however, the massive geological features in an otherwise flat landscape attracted the interest of the local Aboriginal people, the Noongar, who have occupied the area for at least the last 50,000 years. Um, and this is a very well-known um, uh, panorama that was uh, produced into a plate from a sketch by Robert Dale, one of the colonisers of the um, King George Sound region in the south, on the south coast of Western, Western Australia. And that, I think, is the Stirling Ranges there. This is the Parongarups. Um, Okay, so the Noongar cosmology makes few distinctions between human and non-human. Humans and animals are relatives, and for thousands of years, human movements were dictated by an understanding of seasons arising from changes in flora and fauna. Over time, the Noongar learnt which plants were good to eat and how to burn the bush in small patches at particular times in order to attract kangaroos and other game to hunt. And you can see that fire also features in this panorama. Their stories include conversations between humans and non-humans who were active agents shaping landscape and society. The Noongar people call Bluff Noel Bula Mila, or many eyes, as it has many faces looking at you. In the early 19th century, the peaks attracted the attention of European explorers who scaled them in order to survey the surrounding land. Several years later, sheep began to appear, associated with the colonisation of the south coastal region by graziers, seeking their fortunes by establish, establishing an export economy in wool. As pastoral stations were established, many Noongars began working there, spending time between the old and new economies. The networks that would ultimately produce that odd, irregular, dark green oblong set amongst a patchwork of paddocks begin perhaps in the 1870s when the world's first national parks were being created as natural areas to be protected from alienation and conserved for public, public recreation and enjoyment. The person who brought these ideas most forcefully to the Stirling Ranges was Jose Guillermo Hay. Born in Chile and raised in California, Hay was a draftsman in the New South Wales Lands Department in the lead up to creation of Australia's first national park south of Sydney in 1879. This is only seven years after Yellowstone, although it was created for quite different purposes. By 1903, Hay was living in East Perth and had joined the Mueller Botanic Society, then the state's only scientific organisation. Perhaps he read an article, an illustrated article, although their um, uh, plate reproduction technology at the time I think really failed to capture the kind of drama <laughs> of the Stirling Ranges. Um, Okay, so there's this article in the Western Mail of 1903 when Hayes is living in East Perth. And this article describes the beauty and rarity of the flora and avifauna of the Stirling Ranges and concluded that it would be an ideal tourist resort if not for the prevalence of scrub ticks. Now, no evidence survives that Hay ever visited the range, so the scrub ticks probably didn't make much of an impression on him. However, over subsequent years, he became increasingly captivated by the idea of the region's unique flora and fauna. And in 1910, he wrote to the Premier to request that a thousand square miles around the range be, quote, permanently dedicated as a national park for the preservation of native flora and fauna, as well as for public health, recreation and enjoyment of future generations as for the present population of Western Australia. So a familiar kind of discourse to the one uh, we know from the creation of national parks in the US, later on in, a, in uh, other parts of Australia, Canada, New Zealand and so on. There are subtle differences though and in my book I would talk about some of those differences. The notion that immersion in particular forms of nature could improve human health and well-being underpinned a range of progressive initiatives in Australia in this era, from national parks to town planning, slum clearance and kindergartens. Although generally regarded by historians only as an environmental determinist idea that was used in the exercise of class and technocratic power, I argue that it also had some material basis. Humans respond to different environments, not only intellectually, but also emotionally and physiological, physiologically. And recent studies have shown that natural environments of various types have positive physiological effects in humans. So in my book I intend to kind of work through the historical implications of these findings. 
But returning for now to the Stirlings. Like many other national park advocates of the era, Hay saw no conflict between conservation and recreation. Here was a nature so discreet that it could be preserved by humanity while it sustained humanity. Drawing on both Australian and American precedents, he happily mixed the progressive languages of public health and recreation and the religious language of creation in order to buttress his argument. Other influential citizens supported the proposal and in 1910 an 8,000 acre temporary reservation was declared around the Stirling Rages. Now this decade would see much of the land to the north of the reserve released for agricultural development and so began the physical process by which the reserve's existence as an abstract legal entity, a kind of paper reserve defined by various geographical coordinates, would actually manifest on the ground, would be carved out, defining the shape of the reserve if not its behaviour. Meanwhile, Noongar people continued to move in and around the reserve, although agricultural land didn't offer the same opportunities for Aboriginal involvement as the previous pastoral regime. The pastoral regime was much more akin to their traditional economy, the agricultural one not so much. So many Aboriginal people moved, or indeed were removed, to town camps and reserves. Pressure to open more land for farming saw the Stirling Ranges Reserve reduced to 270,000 acres when it was declared an A-class reserve in 1913. Still, it would be the largest such reserve in Australia until 1954. In recommending the reservation, the Under Secretary for Lands made explicit comparisons with Yellowstone and Yosemite National Parks in the USA. So at this point, the park's shape was a manifestation of progressive ideas circling within and beyond the English-speaking world about recreation and conservation, as well as the ideologies and global market forces driving agricultural development of the surrounding lands. And in the book, I'll be describing those uh, in relation to a case study in the chapter on farms. So the interwar years saw considerable interest in having the park live up to its recreational and commercial potential. In 1921, and here again it has links with the, uh, the development of national parks in the US. In 1921 the park was touted as a splendid health resort again, and there was talk of driving roads through the reserve and constructing a chalet in the mountains. This continued throughout the 1920s as increasing emphasis was placed on both whoops, preserving and developing the state's natural beauties for tourism. Uh, and here's an ad from the nearby Prongarup Ranges, um, which I think very well demonstrates the, that kind of new world attitude to uh, national parks. If we don't have castles, we can at least have a castle rock. I'd argue that this interest in nature-based tourism was not only economic, but also the corollary to a cultural turn in this era towards the novel and the modern, associated with increasing urbanisation and the rise of mass production of consumer goods. So on the one hand, I think there was an enthusiasm, particularly amongst urban people, and Australia is increasingly highly urbanised in this period, uh, for this new flash urban modernity. But as nature appeared to be receding from everyday, everyday life and ideas about good and bad nature are evolving, urban dwellers are increasingly seeking out good nature, whether in the form of the second nature of urban parks and gardens or the more sublime wild nature supposedly contained in reserves and national parks. While unruly bad nature, for example in the form of uh, uh, livestock and poultry in the suburbs, is being banished through um, increasing government, local government regulation, nature-based tourism is increasingly pursued by those able to afford it. The rugged terrain of the Stirling Ranges and its remoteness from settlements proved insurmountable, insurmountable obstacles to mass tourism and by the end of the 1940s, though a trail had been blazed through the bush to the foot of Bluff Knoll, the lack of water and other basic facilities meant that visitor numbers remained low. After the war, efforts to turn the park into a mountain resort were renewed and these were praised in one of the state's daily papers which declared that it should be our constant aim to examine and catalogue all our potential resources with a view to their development in the state's interest. Not everyone concurred. In the 1940s, educated people with an interest in native flora and fauna were arguing that national parks should be preserved in their natural state as primitive areas devoid of human influence rather than being developed for tourism and other forms of recreation. But the area's ecosystems were inextricably entangled with human activities in and especially around the reserve. 
By the 1940s, there was considerable build-up of dry wooden leaves and landholders adjacent to the park were letting fires go into it to protect themselves. Still, large bushfires swept through the park in 1949 and 1950. The Noongar people, meanwhile, had not disappeared from the area. Complaints from tourists in 1964 revealed that some were still camping, along with their dogs, in the western part of the reserve at Red Gum Springs, one of the few potable water sources in the area and doubtless, for that reason, a traditional camping ground. Someone was also, according to the archives, lighting fires at Mount Trio in the eastern part of the reserve, always in the same area and always the same wind, a pattern of deliberate burning suggesting Aboriginal involvement. But there were now insufficient Aboriginal people, or indeed anyone with the requisite understanding and resources, to maintain traditional burning practices over the entirety of the park. In 1965, one of the local bushfire brigades complained to the National Parks Board that it's becoming extremely difficult to take a motor vehicle into the park to fight a fire, owing to the heavy regrowth of bush and scrub. So as the bush, liberated from Aboriginal burning regimes, grew back with an unusual density, the bushfire brigades on all sides of the park struggled to clear fire breaks. When they did so, these provided corridors into the park for the entry of cosmopolitan animals and plants, including foxes, rabbits and weeds. <coughs> foxes would later be targeted by helicopters dropping baits laced with sodium fluoroacetate poison. Although fluoroacetate occurs naturally in some of the common local plants, and there's a very interesting kind of side story relating to these poison plant species. Um, the baits that they used to kill the foxes were imported from Alabama. Most likely, the tyres of the bushfire brigade vehicles also carried mud containing an introduced water mould, Phytophthora cinnamomai, into and through the park where it, can, where it killed susceptible vegetation, changing the composition of the flora. By 1994, it was widely distributed throughout the park. This is the area um, that was identified as Phytophthora affected in 1994. It's since spread further. Um, and managers had begun a program of spraying rare vegetation with phosphite to increase its resistance to the disease. So far from being primitive, wild nature, the park was being managed with increasing intensity. From the late 1950s to the 1970s, another set of developments saw the land to the south of the park transformed. These are predominantly light lands, that is sandy soils, on which efforts to consistently produce crops had largely failed. In the 1940s and 1950s, agricultural scientists and farmers had collaborated to discover that the soils lacked trace elements such as copper and zinc. Once these were applied, agriculture could be sufficiently productive that the government with great enthusiasm released the land for sale at a rate of a million acres a year, one of the last, large, last such large-scale land releases in the developed world. As the surrounding bushland was rolled and burnt, the more mobile flora flocked to the park, where some would likely have come, come into conflict with resident populations. Many likely starved, being able to find sufficient food in an unfamiliar and already occupied environment. More adaptable species, like the kangaroos, faced another problem. As the land around the park was transformed into farms, they saw just so much green feed. Kangaroos were protected from shooters within the park, but outside it there was an open season on them, so many were lured to their fate in young wheat crops. At this time, social conventions prevented most city people from eating kangaroo, but it was widely consumed by their pets. So many Stirling Rangers kangaroos entered the capitalist economy not as tourist icons, but as pet food destined for the dog bowls of Perth. <coughs> Tourists and locals impacted the park's ecosystems in even in more limited ways. Visitors were found taking away posies of wildflowers or even whole plants. Some looked, took trailer loads of stone. Two lads were foolish enough to write their names on the rock at the top of Bluff Knoll. They were quickly found and cautioned by the police. The National Parks Board seized this opportunity to reaffirm its mission in writing to the parents of one of the vandals. Kindly explain to your son that we are the guardians only for the national parks under board control, whereas in fact the parks really belong to the people. Any effort we make towards avoiding despoilation of them is in the interests of the people and posterity. This was, however, a modern misapprehension. Although the board had been tasked with managing the park, they did not control it, nor did it belong in any meaningful sense to the people. Rather, it was a hybrid entity, a creation in which society and nature were thoroughly entangled and connected to local and global flows of capital, ideas, commodities and bodies. 
So thank you all for listening and I look forward to your comments and questions.